The Committee on Public Education will come to order. The clerk will call the roll. Chairman Buckley? Here. Vice Chairman Allen? Present. Representative Allison? Here. Cunningham? Here. Dutton? Harris? Here. Harrison? Here. Hefner? Here. Hinojosa? Here. King? Here. Longoria? Present. Schaefer? Here. Tallarico? We have a quorum. All right. Uh, a quorum is present. Um, we're going to take up pending business, but before I do, I want to just make a brief statement uh, concerning today's uh, uh, hearing. Um, as a reminder, anyone present wishing to testify before the committee, please register at the kiosk located in the hallways behind the hearing rooms. If you require assistance uh, in registering or in testifying, please speak with committee staff. Um, this is a little bit of a change. I want the public to hear this. Uh, please be aware that there'll be a, a, a time limit of two, min two minutes per witness uh, during the public testimony uh, period. The intent of this hearing is to consider varying approaches to additional school choice options. For that reason, I will ask that each witness keep their testimony limited to the content of the specific bill under consideration. Uh, these bills are, are different, yet they're the same in many instances. So I ask for you to be, uh, um, to be diligent about addressing matters on the bill that is laid out before the committee. And uh, we'll enforce a strict uh, two-minute uh, time limit. So be thinking in your, in, kind of in your head uh, what two minutes feels like. Uh, also, I'll be calling out folks' names ahead of time so you can be prepared so we can run as efficiently as possible as we move forward. So at this time, we're going to take up pending business. We have a thick, thick, thick binder here today. All right. All right. The chair lays out as pending business House Bill 100 by King. Members, this is the bill we heard previously that is relating um, to the co compensation of public school educators and to the public school finance system, including enrollment-based enrollment, enrollment -based funding for certain allotments under the foundation school program, uh, program. The chair offers a committee substitute, and Chairman King, if you'll explain this up, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, uh, um, I'm sure you remember the layout, and then last week on Budget 9, we... I got a practice run on laying this bill out in front of the floor because Mr. Martinez Fisher had questions. So, uh, but today I'm going to talk about the sub, and um, I, it 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 does quite a lot. They're all good changes. But I'm going to, I'll try to go quickly. Uh, regular program allotments and small mid-sized allotments continue in the ADA basis. Um, other allotments, I'll shift enrollment. Uh, CTE regular portion of attendance shifts over to regular allotment. Uh, waits for time spent CT at or set at 0 0.1, 0 0.28, and 0 0.47. SPED shifts um, for special ed, some parts of SPED from FTEs to enrollment. Increases in the basic allotment. Uh, the first year is a $90 increase, bringing the basic allotment to $62.50. The second year, the biennium, it goes to uh, another $50, goes to $6,300. Um, we uh, it it assumes an inflation adjustment beginning in 26 27 um, which is is a uh, the reason that will that will actually be done on a perfecting amendment on the floor because um, the the goal is by the third year we don't do additional dollar increases we uh, we will have a, a inflation based um, average adjustment that will affect the basic allotment on an annual basis so we don't have to do this every time um, special ed shifts uh, to an intensity services model with a transition period from 24 to 25 um, establishes reimbursement to student evaluations increases uh, special ed transportation from a dollar eight to a dollar 67 regular transportation uh, increases by 54 cents a mile to a dollar 54 extends formula transition grants to 29 and 30 uh, increases funding under IFA and EDA programs under Chapter 46 Education Code by basing the guaranteed amount of $35 and $40 respectively for each cent of tax effort to pay debt services on eligible bonds on enrollment instead of attendance. Uh, creates advanced course allotment in, within the Foundation School Program. Provides for new tier one allotments for fine for a fine arts allotment of a weight of 0 .008 and $32 million in funding. Increases weights for educationally disadvantaged students in, res in residential placements to 
2775 and for generally economically disadvantaged compensatory education funding new new census tier weights go up from point uh, 2255 all the way up to point 2755 raises the minimum salary schedule provides minimum salaries for teachers under under and over five years of experience uh, it differentiates between certificates that are held establishes transition grants to ensure funding for uh, districts to uh, pay the salary increases um, by changing the minimum salary schedule and adds a six golden penny uh, for board approval that's all it does so uh, I'll be glad to <laughs> to try to answer questions um, we've talked about this bill quite a bit there's something for everybody in this bill it's uh, I mean I'm excited about it I I think uh, um, I think it's something we can all be proud of but I'll be glad to try to answer any questions all right representative Harrison Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Representative King. I uh, very much appreciate what you're trying to do with HB 100. Um, a lot of substantial changes in the committee sub as you just went over there. Do we have an updated fiscal note for the committee sub? Yeah, the problem with the fiscal note is um, that when, we, when we're doing the um, uh, inflationary adjustment for the basic allotment, mm -hmm. um, they, they assumed that it started in the next biennium and it doesn't it starts till the third year that's that's why we're going to put that on in a, in a perfecting amendment on the floor because the fiscal note today assumes something that's not in this bill right i think it was over five yeah, billion the last right. one. so the impact the direction there will be a directional change in the fiscal note based right. on the committee sub and the perfecting amendment yes in the downward direction no or? not 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 necessarily i mean it's still going to be a um the bill the bill is still worth what the bill is the, the bill is about 4.2 billion is what it is but when they assumed the the adjustment in the first year it made it over 5 billion so it's not a downward anything it's what the bill's always been it just uh the uh the the adjust or the um the fiscal note was assumed on something that's not in the bill oh so, sorry but downward from the original fiscal note projection is that right I don't know. Down, from the five point yeah. one or whatever. Well, from this fiscal note, what this right. says the fiscal note is, it, it, it is, but that was never, it never was that high. Okay. It's, it, it's something that got assumed that wasn't in the bill. Do, do you know when we'll have an updated fiscal note on this? Yes, um, probably today. Okay. But we don't have it yet. We well, don't have it on the sub because, you know, trying to get a sub back these days, I takes too long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Chair. All right. Members, any additional questions? Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? The chair hears none, the substitute is adopted. The chair moves that House Bill 100, as substituted, be reported favorably to the full House with the recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Chairman Buckley? Aye. Vice Chair Allen? Aye. Allison? Aye. Cunningham? Aye. Dutton? Harris? Aye. Harrison? Present. Hefner? Aye. Inahosa? Aye. King? Aye. Longoria? Aye. Schaefer? Aye. Tallarico? Aye. There being 10 ayes, one nay, one present not voting, and one absent, the motion prevails. Chair lays out as pending business House Bill 114 by Thompson. Members, this is the bill we heard previously that is relating to, uh, to the possession of e-cigarettes on public school property or at certain school events. The chair offers a committee substitute. The committee substitute for uh, House Bill 114 replaces the shall with a may requirement for expulsion uh, for the possession, use, or being under the influence of marijuana. School administrators will be able to consider each uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. The bill adds a new requirement that a student caught with, using, or under the influence of marijuana must take an approved intervention class. The committee sub also clarifies that school administrators, school resource officers, and district LEAs have, a, have authority to confiscate e-cigarettes and notify local uh, law enforcement. Uh, a person with the intent to sell or distribute uh, e-cigarettes on a school campus will face a Class B misdemeanor. The bill does not remove the mandatory expulsion penalty for selling, giving, or delivering marijuana to another person, leaving dealers to face serious consequences. The bill makes no changes to the existing criminal penalties for possession or use of marijuana. 
law enforcement retains all current enforcement capability. This will mean that fewer students will be removed from the classroom. Administrators could take full action without the fear of upending a student's academic career. Uh, it addresses a student's problem with a proven and readily available intervention course, uh, more efficient uh, use of ISD and county funds to, at alternative uh, education programs. It encourages intervention and reporting to LEAs of criminal conduct and enhances penalties uh, to address rampant distribution on school campuses. Is there objection to the adoption of the committee substitute? Chair hears none, the substitute is adopted. The chair moves that House Bill 114, as substituted, be reported favorably to the full House with the recommendation that it do pass and be printed. The clerk will call the roll. Chairman Buckley? Aye. Vice Chair Allen? Aye. Allison? Aye. Cunningham? Aye. Dutton? Harris? Aye. Harrison? Aye. Hefner? Aye. Hinojosa? King? Aye. Longoria? Aye. Schaefer? Aye. Tallarico? Aye. Two absent. Yep. There being 11 ayes and two absent, uh, the motion prevails. Okay. Thank you, members. Uh, just a, a note here, there's an overflow room at E2026, E2026. So uh, if you're there here to testify and you're in that room, uh, I'll be listening for your name. I'll try to call them out ahead of time so that you can make your way uh, to this committee room so you're ready to go. Yeah. All right. Chair lays out uh, House Bill 4340 and recognizes Chairman Frank to explain the bill. The chair offers a committee substitute. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Buckley, Vice Chair Allen, and uh, members. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to lay this bill out to you today and the committee substitute. You know, the entire argument, uh, the entire discussion around school choice and or parental education choice, depending on what you want to call it, comes down to perspective, in my opinion. Should parents, should parents be given options uh, to educate their children? When viewed through the eyes of the parent or child, I believe it's hard to come to any other answer than yes, they should have options. I know we'll be here for a while today, so if you'll indulge me, I'd like to do three things in my layout. First, I'd like to just give you a few arguments for school choice. I'd like to lay out some of the details of the bill, uh, particularly as it relates to the committee substitute and the prioritization. I'd like to thank Chair Buckley has uh, worked with me on the prioritization part of this, trying to come up with a plan that the House uh, would at least be worthy. I'm not suggesting he's for it necessarily. Uh, I'm just saying that the House would be uh, most likely to want to discuss. And so I appreciate the opportunity uh, to walk through that with you. And then finally, I'd like to, uh, since I'm not on the committee and not asking questions, I'd like to address some of the common arguments that I think you'll hear and some of my replies uh, ahead of time. Um, uh, first, the reasons for parental education choice. I'm actually going to start instead of with the parents' perspective from the public school's perspective. When I talk to my public schools, and I've got 14 counties, members, I'm a rural, I've got a rural district. I've got 26, or excuse me, 28 school districts. The number one issue they talk about is the lack of parental engagement. The lack of parental engagement. Um, they also talk about, obviously, discipline, but that usually is followed with, and the parents won't do anything about it. They're not engaged. Um, but when you think about it, for the last 50 or 60 years, almost everything in our public school system has been set up to remove parental engagement. Just one small example. Kids used to come to school hungry. People would take care of them. Now we have school systems set up, and through no fault of their own, doing great things, we're feeding 100% of the kids off in breakfast, lunch, and sending food home on the weekends. The parents are no longer have any responsibility for that. We have really kind of taken that away from them for great reasons, for great reasons. But the parents are completely unengaged because of that. And then we're shocked that people aren't sitting around the family table. What can be done to engage parents? I've actually talked to the schools, and I would encourage you to talk to your schools about what can be done to engage parents. What can be done to re-engage parents? I would say re-engage, because this is a fairly recent phenomenon. But I do think this one tool, the being able to decide where your child goes to school, is the number one uh, criteria around engagement. Most of the people up on this dais decided where their kids go. You had options. It will absolutely benefit public schools when everybody, when all kids have options of where to go to school. It will benefit the schools themselves. Parents, I think it's a no-brainer. It will benefit parents. Parents should absolutely be the primary decision makers uh, for their kids. And yes, I understand that there are bad parents. I have chaired the uh, human services for the last three sessions for six years. I am well aware that there are bad parents. And we have processes to take care of those and actually remove the decision-making for them. 
But absent that, we should assume the parent has the best interest of the child at heart, and we should be doing things to encourage that. Every child is different. Every child is different. I've got four biologicals. I cannot believe kids can be that different with two of the same parents. I also have two adopted kids, totally different needs in those kids. But you know what I had? I had the ability to decide what and where to educate my kids. Why? Because I have money. Most of y'all have either money or you have uh, contacts to be able to handle, to get your kids wherever they need to be. You can make the decision that is not available to most Texans. It's good for parents, it's good for kids, and it's good for schools. How does the bill work? If I can, uh, Chairman, can I pass out just the uh, that one sheet? Does the committee sub the main change? Thank you. I'll give it just a second. Many of y'all have seen this. I, uh, been working on the prioritization for a while, uh, and as soon as I heard it was, uh, we were set for a hearing, I submitted it, but we just now got the, uh, uh, the committee sub back. But this is, the, this is the crux of the change in the committee sub. It's the prioritization of who would be available. Uh, to start with, the, the amount of money, the amount of money is 90%, that's not on this sheet, but the amount of money is 90% of statewide average of M&O, 90%. Obviously, doesn't include any INS money. That would be on top, but that, that members is around $10,300. And that again is 90% of MO. That's the amount of, that's the pool that we're talking about. There obviously is no INS money added to that. Um, but if you're on the left side, if you're a current, if you're a student currently enrolled, then you will be eligible for 100% uh, uh, ESA. If you are a student not currently enrolled, then you would only be eligible for a 50%. And the theory there is there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people working very hard to get their kids in private schools, or a lot of people skipping vacations, working hard. We want to give those people help, uh, but we also don't want to uh, pay, basically pay for the whole thing. That was the, the logic behind that number. I'm not saying, you know, this is a committee hearing. We're having, we'll have discussions uh, both here and afterwards, uh, but that is, that's the logic behind that. If, as you go down uh, the list, you realize that People who have money, people who have contacts have school choice already. Uh, the number one thing regarding school choice is whether you have funds to do it. So we decided to make the priorities based on whether or not you had funds. So the first priority group is students who have, or whose parents have less than 100% of reduced lunch. Those, that the, the first priority group that the money would go to would be them. And by the way, just, just so you know, the, the bill is simply a pathway. We're not making appropriations in the bill that's done elsewhere. We're just setting the pathway of who gets it, how much money uh, will be determined by uh, somebody, not this bill author. Uh, the second priority group is for over 200% uh, or for up to 200%, excuse me, of reduced lunch. And then finally, uh, special needs students, anyone over 200% that has a special needs would be in the third group. And then finally, the fourth group, anyone else, it's unlikely that there would be money there, but that would be a limited to 50% uh, ESA, whether they were in schools or uh, in public schools. So uh, that's the way uh, that, it, that it is outlined, um, basically to try to give priority to the parents who have the least education um, choice for their kids. So be happy to answer any other questions. That's the, or any questions on that? All right. Finally, I wanna, I wanna answer some of the questions I think that we'll have um, against this. The first one, and this is to me a little bit perplexing, public funds shouldn't go to a private business. Now I say perplexing because this is done in so many different government programs where public funds for a public purpose go to a private entity. You think about our university systems. We have a university system that is the envy of the world. It has public funds. You have state schools, private schools, but you have public funds going through Pell Grants to all types of schools, all types of schools. And I think it is of note that we have a university system that is the envy of the world, but we have a plural, pluralistic university system. But it's not just that. You have GI Bill, Head Start, WIC goes to private, Medicaid, Medicare goes to private hospitals, Section 8 housing. My personal favorite, food stamps. Food stamps is loaded on a Lone Star card, a credit card. Money is put on there. The food stamp recipient goes to a private business, let's say an HEB, goes to a private business and spends money for a public good. 
to feed that person at a private business, we give, we give food stamp recipients 10 times more flexibility in how they spend their food stamp money than we give parents with how they spend their education dollars. That shouldn't be. We should give parents the flexibility, I believe, with how to educate their children. Another uh, argument that I got is we already have choice in Texas. In fact, I got this from somebody in the hall a couple days ago. We already have choice in Texas. We have charter schools, and, it's, and actually this was the argument. It's, already, it's working great. It's been good for public schools. It's, it's been good for kids. And I said, so your, your answer is this choice is working great. It's helping everybody, but we need less of it. If it's working great for people, we need more of it. And there are many people that don't have access to charter schools that might have access under this. Uh, also, as a, as a rural rep with 14 counties, this will hurt uh, rural schools. Giving parents choices, as I've already talked about, I don't believe hurts at all. Uh, our great public schools have nothing to worry about. Our public schools are in great shape. I'm um, actually hearing two arguments about rural schools. One is it will devastate them, so they must be held harmless. The other is there are no services in the rural areas, therefore uh, it won't benefit them. Both of those things can't be true. Both of those things cannot be true. Uh, in reality, neither will happen. Uh, in Florida, which is uh, far, far ahead of us, has the most robust parental choice over the last two decades, has seen an overwhelming majority of families choose to stay in traditional public schools, but the few families who need it, the few families who need it have been able uh, to access it. And members, this really is about people who need it. There are a few people, I don't care how good your public school is. I mentioned this on the floor, but it was kind of loud. You may have the best public schools. You may have, in your district, you may have the very best public school. But there are still going to be kids that fall through the cracks. This gives an opportunity for kids who are falling through the cracks, for whatever reason, the opportunity to, for, another, for another option. And their parents gives them an opportunity uh, for another option. So in closing, what I almost never, ever, ever hear is an argument against parental choice is that it's bad for kids or it's bad for the parents. Almost never hear that. Almost never hear that it's bad for the kids or bad for the parents. Schools are about kids. Parents should have as many options as possible. And great schools in Texas will continue to flourish thanks to the leadership of folks on this committee and, and, and folks that are even against this bill. They will continue to flourish. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for indulging me. All right, members, any questions for Chairman Frank? I we have Representative, whoop. Can't see it. You? you just assumed it would be. Well, I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Representative Hinojosa. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for um, explaining your bill. I've not seen the committee sub, um, so forgive me if, if no, that's I'm all right. speaking forgive, to Forgive me. That's not in that bill, but I'm trying to figure out, um, I think yours is the most audacious of all the, <laughs> the bills that I've seen in, in preparing for this committee. Yours spends the most of our uh, general revenue. I see half a billion first year and then within four years going to a billion dollars because there's a 25% increase uh, every and, year. Is and, that correct? The, I'm sorry. Is that correct? So the, the fiscal note is on the original, not on the committee sub, and really it will be decided by appropriations how much money is in the plan. If there's no money appropriated, including in the, I, I believe what the, and I, I just saw the fiscal note early this morning, uh, I believe what the fiscal note assumes is the, the, the entire uh, tax credit, the half a billion dollars in available tax credit is funded and plus the ancillary expenses at the comptroller's office for managing the program. But the actual amount in there, I think, will be determined later. My recollection in your okay. original bill is the amount five hundred million. Oh, I'm sorry. In the, I'm sorry. You are, you are correct in your okay. original bill. Okay. Okay. Um, so five hundred million first year, and then a twenty-five percent, according to the bill, yeah. increase as much every as, yes. year, which um, strikes me as pretty rich, considering if you think about it, in our public schools, we have not had an increase to the basic allotment since 2019. Um, to keep up with inflation, it would be a 17% increase since then, but we're not even doing that. So why is such a disparity when most of our kids, even if this bill were to pass, remain 
will remain in our public schools, the vast majority of our kids. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. I, I, I would answer it two ways. Um, and I, first of all, certainly we're not done with funding uh, the public schools this session. Second, the funding is really based on the public, what the public schools are getting. So really it becomes in lockstep because honestly, educating kids is a public function, whether they're in public schools or elsewhere, I believe they're part of our community. Um, but they are also getting around 75% when you take into consideration, it's 90% of M&O, zero of INS. So we're doing for essentially have a $10,300 where currently it's close to 14,000 in the public schools. While I would argue that's not that rich, you know, if 14,000 is for the public schools and only 10,300 is here, I'm not sure I would call that rich. But I do think that it's important to note that one of the arguments against this in the past, and I would make this argument, is if you give a child a scholarship but they can't afford to go to the private school, you really haven't given them anything other than you, they can smell the steak but they can't get there. Okay, the average, the average private school in the state costs around $9,700. So this does give every child an opportunity to go to a private school. It gives them 100% of the funds, and again, it prioritizes those with less money. So just so you're aware, um, my school district gets, I've asked my school district, $8,572 as what we get, that, so we don't get the state average. So the way the state average works is there's so many school districts in the state, lots of little ones, right? And so um, the vast majority of kids don't get the state average because the vast majority of kids are in urban districts and we don't get the benefit of uh, small to mid-size adjustments. So, so my school district wouldn't get as much as a per child as a private school in your voucher. Can my right. ISD apply to to be a participant, or can I, our parents apply to be a participant I, I, and get that money? I, 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 abso I absolutely, and I, and I will I will look at that, and I am okay. certainly not, there's, there's people that are more expert than I am on this. I am almost certain, and I have not looked at Austin ISD, but when you look at total funds, the amount of total funds per child in Austin ISD, I can almost promise you it is over 13 or 14, it's around over $13,000. It is not, now the part that comes from the state, but they also have local funds, they also have federal funds. And again, I, I will, uh, in my closing, or an expert may be able to do that, but if you talk total funds divided by the number of kids, I will bet you that Austin is closer to 13,000. But I think anybody who wants to be on the 10,300, I think, I would, I would consider, for your, for your positive vote, I would consider an amendment. <laughs> on the bill do just that well, thank you but i don't think many schools would be willing to sign up for that money um okay well i mean if they were able to not have to take the star test and instead do these um I, criterion I, reference tests and not have to be in the a through f accountability system and get more money per student i bet everybody would all the isds would sign up for that. I, I also i also am more than happy hmm. i'm also more than happy i have i have voted to get rid of the star test and i think norm reference tests are a much better way to do it and not as controlled by third parties. So I, L let me and I hope this can be used as, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I have a question, your bill, and I've noticed this language reoccurring, um, takes tax credits from insurance premiums, so from insurance companies, and uses that as a source of revenue to pay for uh, this voucher. I'm curious why that tax was selected because we have that's a you know small pool of companies but why insurance companies i honestly it's a, it's a financing mechanism that removes it once from general revenue i actually prefer a cleaner just call it gr because essentially all you're doing is taking tax revenue that was coming in some people find it more palatable i i actually would prefer to just do a straight gr uh and i, I would note and i did not mention in the layout none of this bill comes from uh, the foundation school funds. This, this is GR or tax credits. It's completely separate. It's the same thing that pays for, same monies that pay for roads, water, Medicaid, all of, all of that. It's just GR. Okay. Um, that's all I have for now. Okay. Thank you. All right, all right. Uh, Dr. Allen. Thank you. You say choice. Yes, ma'am. What are the choices? I hear you say private schools. 
What are the ch other choices? Private schools, tutors, they homeschool. Um, it, it really, the, the, the legislation allows the parent to decide then the, the comptroller has certain approved vendors. It has to be, and the money doesn't, uh, try not to make the layout too long, the money doesn't actually go to the parent. No, money we, is in an account. We, we have time. Okay, no, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the, mon the money is in an account and is spent only for approved education providers. It can be tutors. There's, there's a list of them, uh, tutors up to $1,000 of transportation. Um, it cannot go to anybody in the family or in a third degree of sang sanguinity. I never can say that word. Uh, so there's a lot of protections to make sure that it is only going to approved uh, academic uh, services for the benefit of the child. It never goes to the, it never goes to the parent. If it is not spent, the money ends up coming back to the state. But I heard you say homeschool. That's parent. Well, it doesn't go to the homeschool parent. The credit. The account is there and available. So if a homeschooler, let's say, I mean, there's a lot of homeschoolers I know that can't buy the curriculum that you would like. They, they, they can't buy curriculum. The state has uh, made sure they can't get the curriculum from the state. If they need to buy curriculum, that would be, if it is an approved vendor of the curriculum, they could actually get that curriculum. But I don't think homeschoolers, I, I think there's not a lot of homeschoolers, I think, that will use this, but it would be available to them if they need it. I think we need to make that clear. Where, where where the money uh, is going. Um, where are the, the private schools that, are there enough private schools up there? And I'll, I'll take Houston for an example or surrounding areas. Uh, there are 190,000 uh, kids in the Houston Independent School District. Where are uh, there are enough private schools to absorb all of those kids if every kid had an opportunity? Well, there, there's certainly not there's certainly not enough to instantaneously change that, but you do change the market. There's around, I believe, over 50,000 seats available today. So you can handle, which is part of the way we came up with the half a billion dollars. There's around 50,000 seats. Empty seats. Empty seats. Empty or, seats. Empty seats that, that, that would be available for private schools to add, and there'll be others that can testify on where, where, I can't tell you exactly where those are. I don't know how many are exactly are available in Houston, but there are empty seats there. And, 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 and before now, or before this were to come in place, the only demand for a private school setting is somebody that has $10,000 to spend. And 10,000 after tax money is not something that most people can do, especially if you have more than one or two kids. And so, you know, while the private school is significantly less than what the public school is spending on average, that is still out of reach for the vast majority of people. Okay, choice might be if some kid, if I want to send my kid over here for STEMs and then I want to send over here for the arts and then I want to send it, maybe I have another one and I want to send it. Is transportation in here? Can this money be used for transportation? Yes, ma'am, up to $1,000. Up to $1,000. And again, it has to be an approved vendor, but yes, up to $1,000. Okay, special need kids. I agree. Public, public schools must take all comers. We can't turn anyone around. Um, there are kids who need diaper services, uh, ventilators, uh, nurses, uh, all kinds of services. Yes. Uh, are there private schools for those kids? There are, there are some private schools that handle much higher acuity needs. I will say just like a, a traditional public school gets twenty to thirty thousand dollars to take care of those kids mm -hmm. and 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 still have trouble doing it it's still a challenge for them to do it uh, this this does not contemplate that because the money's simply not there to handle that almost all private schools handle a percentage some percentage of uh, uh, learning challenged kids okay so we we're not being but, inclusive if we're not including everybody we are we are that is we are, that is correct. Okay. I just want to put that out there so that no, I agree. people I agree. are not. Uh, and, I, and I think it's important to note, public school systems take everyone. Public schools, many public schools don't. Like magnet public schools decide who they take. They're, you know, and even, and even in a public school setting, if somebody behaves to a certain degree, there is often a place to put them somewhere else. Um, so you take kids with discipline problems. Excuse me? Discipline, kids with discipline problems. Well, each... So each, under the legislation, the parent chooses where they go. And the, each, each entity, and there'll be some to testify, has their own 
entrance requirement and entrance expectations. Yeah. So but I'm, I'm certain they have discipline problems at private schools as well, and they, but they do have ways to deal with them. Like put them out. Okay. Yeah. Just checking. Just checking. Um, yeah. um, because private schools do have a choice. They can decide who they take and who they do not take into their schools, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What is the uh, what is the total amount of a of a this is a voucher? What is the total amount that a, a parent can use? Uh, according to the, the 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 bill is actually based on the state average M and O, ninety percent of that. And currently, my bet the best numbers I've gotten is ten thousand three hundred dollars. But it's it's definitely definitionally ninety percent of the state average M and O. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Representative Tallarico. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, yeah. Chairman Frank. Yeah. Typically, the James Caucus is on the same side of most issues. Uh, we'll be there. Basically. Yes. Um, but no, and, I, and I'm, I'm <laughs> thankful that you're starting this conversation. Um, I do think there are some people in this broader discussion who are doing it in bad faith. I do not think you're one of those people. Um, I, and, I appreciate that. And so that's why I have some some actual questions for you about <laughs> the bill. Um, and, and I want to hear your response and also want to hear responses for, from some of the witnesses. Full disclosure, Chairman Frank, as you know, I'm a product of public schools. I would not be on this dais if it wasn't for public schools. I think some other folks here would right. say the same thing. That's why I taught in a public school. That's why I serve on this committee. So that's why any of these proposals I'm going to look at with a fine tooth comb just to make sure there is no damage being done to public schools. So first I want to talk about that, uh, the average price, because the number that I'm looking at is 11407 as the average tuition for private school in Texas. You had a, a, a different number, but it wasn't, it was a little it lower. It was 9700 is okay. the number okay. I have. Um, that's an average, at least the one I'm looking at. Sure. So I just want to clarify, and I think you and I have talked about this. The best private schools in Texas, you know, St. John's in Houston, St. Stephen's here in Austin, those are going to be a lot more than, than the average here. I, I would say the most expensive private schools. I don't know that I would always say the best. Or the most well-known, maybe. I would say the, okay. the most well-known, but I don't know that that means the best. Sure. I just want to, because I think when this discussion is happening, um, some folks, as we know, Absolutely. we have constituents who don't follow the legislature in every detail, and they hear... They're going to get to send their kid to a private school. That may be the one they're thinking about. I just want to clarify that this average we're using, the number in your bill, is, is probably not going to cover the most well-known. Again, your, right. your point about quality is, uh, is well taken. Um, so in some of the other states that I've been looking into that have tried this, typically they see these um, private schools in response to a, a voucher program um, raise their tuition cost just because that's how the market works. There's more... Um, demand, more competition, and so their their tuition bills go up. Is that something that you've seen or are aware of or thinking about how to counteract something like that in your bill? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I don't, I don't have mechanisms to counteract it in the bill. We can certainly look at that. I, I would say since the first priority group, and I think the person who is going to get virtually all of the first tranche, I don't know how much that's going to be, but are people making... Uh, reduced lunch, I think if they go anything over the 10,300, they're going to find themselves not with students. The demand, the demand will drop dramatically because I don't think you're going to find those students paying a thousand bucks even to extra to go. And, and what we've also seen is in, and this is what I'm concerned about too, is the, um, as soon as these uh, voucher bills are passed, we s suddenly see kind of strip mall private schools set up, meaning they like set up right after the bill is passed and they're the exact amount for the voucher, which, mm -hmm. you know, some, some entrepreneur, <laughs> right, saw an opportunity to make money and so went up and set up these kind of strip mall private schools. Is there, are you, how are you thinking about that and how we could possibly prevent that from happening? Because I don't want to, you know, because I'm, I'm worried about parents or kids being preyed upon by, sure. by some of these folks who are, who are not education experts, right, who, who can just set up this private school down the street once the voucher is passed? Well, I think, I, I think in almost all the cases that you're talking about, those places also close down within a year, right? Because it's amazing how quick choice changes behavior. If, if they are not getting the services that they want at those schools, those schools are out of business very quickly. So the entrepreneurs are failed entrepreneurs. If they actually do a good job of educating kids in those strip centers or strip malls, uh, may have very good education going on with those children. I hear that. My concern is, for, as just an educator, um, you know, you can't redo your, you know, your first year in kindergarten. Um, 
you know, you're, we saw just with COVID, with schools being shut down, the tremendous damage that did to kids and that learning loss, we're still trying to figure out how we're gonna recover from that. <laughs> and and in many cases, kids won't recover from that. Right. And, and so, I, so I just want us to be thinking about that because even one year loss is, right. does tremendous damage to kids, as you know. No, I, I appreciate it. Um, um, I want to go to the parent, because you mentioned parent engagement, which I absolutely agree with you on. Um, I think, and I've said this in this committee before, parents are our greatest partners. If I'm thinking about when I was a teacher, my best ally was a parent or a family member. We say parents, sure. we mean sure. family members of course. or guardian. Um, and I made, I was, I was kind of known in my school for making calls to parents. And I called every parent multiple times through the year, not just for negative stuff, that sometimes happened, but for positive stuff. Because sometimes parents, let's be honest, in our, in, our current, um, in our current ecosystem, only get calls when something bad happens. Absolutely. And that's, none of us want, want that. So I always tried to make sure that we were calling parents for good things too. So my question though is, because uh, everything we do in this body is a choice, especially when it comes to money. We don't have unlimited taxpayer dollars, so we gotta make choices. Why not solve, why not tackle that problem from a, you know, making sure that every teacher has that has training on parental engagement and doing the stuff that I did in the classroom, or a parental liaison on every campus, or, and I've thrown this idea out at you before, paying a parent to stay home with their kids. You know, these different ideas, and the, you know, they cost different amounts of money, but just curious why, I agree with you on the problem of parental engagement. Right. Why go this route, which a lot of us have concerns about, versus some of these other routes? Well, I, I, I'm really, truly am happy to talk with you on virtually any of those, because, and I say talk, I think we can meet Sure. and agree on a lot of those. I, I will say no matter what you do with those, no matter how engaged you get a public school teacher, I, I love public schools, I truly do. And you're a product of public school, I'm a product of public schools. I wouldn't be here without public schools, same. Yeah. Not every kid is the same. Sure. Not every kid is the same. And you know, anybody who has parents know, and I think almost everybody that I've talked to will tell me about somebody in their family that did something a little different. We're not attacking, and I know there are people, quote, on this side of the issue that are going attacking public schools. I think that's harmful. It, it, it doesn't do any good, right? Um, but to pretend that there's never a public school setting that doesn't work for a particular child and we're going to leave that child without an option, I don't care how, my, how many times that public school parent, teacher calls, sometimes that option is not best for them, you know? Um, and so, I and so I, I so I agree with you. I just think this is one of the solutions, and I think it is. Um, when you decide to stay, like if you have a choice, and I know there's people, uh, you know, in public schools, you have it. But if you have a choice and you put them there by choice, that is one level of engagement. If you put them there because you can't afford to move, that's a different level of engagement, and that's where we have a lot of people right now. Yeah, I, and so I, I, so I just think it's a good policy. For yes, me. and I, I hear and I know that all kids are different. All of my students were completely different and not every setting works for every child. And so I'm with you on that. Again, it's the jump that I'm making to this proposal. Whereas sure. what I see is there's nothing inherently better about a private school, uh, right? Absolutely. Same human beings, same brick and mortar, right? Oftentimes private schools just have really rich parents who pay a lot of money to give them every resource they could, they could get, right? Like a St. John's or a St. Stephen's. Uh, and so what I'm thinking is there's nothing that our public schools can't do that a private school can do if we give them the resources, right? And maybe I'm naive, but I'm kind of, you know, I'm an eighth generation Texan, so I don't think there's anything our schools can't do if we set them up for success. So that's why, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make is, is I, could, I agree on some of these principles that you're laying out. My issue is why not just take these limited funds that we have and make sure that we create a setting for every child, whether it's through magnets, which you talked about, whether it's academies, early uh, early college high schools, sure. whether it's loosening up the ability for parents to move within public district, you know, I'm, I'm willing to entertain any of these options. I think that's, I'm trying to figure out what, there's nothing magical about a private school. But. I, 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 agree, I agree that there's not anything magical. I do, I do think there are some times where parents, kids, and even the school themselves need a fresh start. Sure. Need, need just, for whatever reason, you know, in as close to perfect a situation or close to perfect public school situation, you've gotten frustrated with a coach, parent, there's just a, there's a, or teacher, and there's a, there's yeah. just needs to be a pressure release valve and that parent needs to be able to move. And honestly, that's why I believe it'll be better for the parent, the child, and I truly believe it'll be a pressure release valve for some of the schools because everyone that is there, 97, 98% of the people that are there 
are there because they chose to be there, not, I, because, not because they had no other choice. And I completely believe you that that, that is your motivation. I don't know if that's everyone's motivation in this I, debate, but I do know yeah. I do know you're willing to <laughs> take on tough fights even within your own party on things that you think are right. I want to, because this is, I immediately, when you made this comment, I was like, I, James and I have, or Chairman Frank and I have worked on some of these issues. You, <laughs> James right now. You, um, you talked about uh, public dollars uh, not, or uh, going to private entities in healthcare and in higher ed. For public purposes. Right, yes. I, I, the reason that alarmed me, though, is because you and I both know how, how messed up our higher ed and healthcare systems are, and especially how, when I say messed up, I mean how inaccessible and unaffordable they've become, right? And I, so my, my worry is doing the same thing to our public schools would have the same effect as higher education. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing our colleges, of, uh, our colleges and universities in Texas. I think there's a lot of people doing great work, and as you mentioned, some of them are the envy of the world. But I remember a time when we regulated tuition as the legislature, mm -hmm. and when we stopped doing that, suddenly you saw the costs skyrocket. And honestly, I'm kind of wondering where some of those costs have gone, mm -hmm. right? Right. And and why are things much more? Why is it so much? You know, why is it so much more expensive to go to college now than it was in 1973? Right. And what is the difference? So my worry is, are we doing the same thing now? With K through 12, curious how you would respond because I know you're concerned about sure that too. I, no, so, absolutely the. At the end of the day, policies matter and what you incent matter. In this case, we're talking about putting in probably 75% of the money that's currently being spent in the schools. So that's a pretty efficient spend, I think. Yeah. But if you look at the, I mean, each of those problems is different. If you look at the university problems, you put literally trillions of dollars in there of basically a huge lines of credit to 18 year olds to get any degree they want. And then we're shocked that the money didn't get spent well and prices went up. It was poor. It was just poor policy decisions. I, I think that's why I think when, and I'm hoping that when y'all are hearing testimony, we're focusing on this policy decision because you can write bad bills, sure. you can write good bills. I'm not saying this bill is perfect, but I am saying it has been thought out fairly well. Uh, does it have holes in it? I mean, some people are just going to be philosophically, I'm absolutely against it no matter what. Some are going to take a look and say, okay, this may have a possibility, so what should the policy look like? I think this session, we're going to look at what this looks like, and so we ought to at least try to come up with the best policy if we're going to move forward on it. Completely, I agree, and I and I this is my last question, and I, I do want to thank you because we do have a lot of different proposals. In your design, you are trying to make sure it goes to uh, poor kids in, in the design, but I do want to flag that Florida, which you mentioned, removed all of their eligibility requirements in, uh, in terms of income, and we know in this... In this legislature, <laughs> someone can start with an idea, sure. and then it. And so I'm just trying to get your, at least for your bill, would you ever be in support of something like that of removing these income eligibility requirements, in a, in, a, in, in, in essence, using taxpayer dollars to subsidize wealthy families who are going to private well, school? No, this this does just so you see it, because I don't want to mislead you. It sure. does go all the way down to quote wealthy parents. Sure. They only get a 50 percent, and so. Mm -hmm. This, this does have a pathway to help everyone. Um, I mean, the reality is we have wealthy parents already going to public schools in this state, spending 15,000 of taxpayer dollars on behalf of the wealthiest students in the state, right? In, in public schools, but we are already subsidizing those. I, I would not be in favor of removing the priorities because like I said before, uh, wealthy people already have choice. Mm -hmm. And so to me, you, ha you have to go you have to go to those folks first. I guess that's what I, so I'm concerned though, is that if even in your bill, eventually wealthy families are gonna be able to use my taxpayer dollars to send their kid to the school they're already sending them to, whereas that taxpayer dollar could have gone to helping my old students on the west side of San Antonio. Well, that's, that's my, cause I, cause I hear, what you, hear you when you're focused on fairness and um, you know, poor families don't have these opportunities, I hear that. But that's why I'm concerned. If we have limited taxpayer dollars, why they would be going to help those? Well, and, and, and in this case, let's say you did get that wealthy parent. They would receive a 50% voucher, so around $5,100, $5,200. If they're coming out of public school where they're spending $14,000, that actually would be a net savings. We would be actually only subsidizing that parent by $5,200 instead of by $14,000, wouldn't it? So you would have the private school, theoretically, you would be paying half of theirs. But honestly, I, um, I don't know how wealthy you have to be to, to spend $10,000 a kid, but that's a lot of money to spend on kids. And that's because we keep talking about um, 
you know, I'm hearing, I'm hearing parental choice, school choice, um, as if these dollars only belong to the parents. But as you know, many taxpayers, including me, I might be the only member on this diocese who doesn't have kids yet. <laughs> um, I, I own a house in Austin um, and I pay property taxes, a lot of them. Uh, yep. um, and those aren't directly helping me. And I'm glad to because Absolutely. public schools benefit us all. That's the reason we all pay for them, right? It's not a, I'm not just going to the counter to buy something for me. I'm using my dollars that I worked hard for to make sure that we build schools that are going to make sure that, you know, ensure we have an educated workforce, a democracy for us to enjoy in the future. Um, that's why it's in our state constitution. And so I'm, I, I want to be wary of talking about taxpayer dollars belonging just to parents because those dollars come from all of us. They belong to all of us. Absolutely. Um, this is not something that's just uh, pick and choose. I, I agree. And everyone, if I may, everyone benefits from an educated, uh, from, from children being educated, but that includes all children. All, all is all children, right? Public school children, private school children, homeschool children. We benefit from that. That is a government purpose. That's why we have that. We want an educated, we want children you, to be educated. And I'm glad we're starting this, more, this today with that because I think that is, at least for this bill, I think is our true motivation. I think we're just, I'm worried about unintended consequences that maybe would contradict that goal. And I, I truly agree with you that the money doesn't belong to the parents. In this case, the money doesn't actually go to the parents, right? It's actually in an account set for them. It never ends up in their pocket, okay? But it also doesn't belong to the school. The purpose of it is the kid. Yep. The purpose is not the school. That's right. The purpose is to educate children. And that's and I think for the rest of the day, I hope we can all acknowledge these are taxpayer dollars. Yeah, absolutely. Whether you're a parent or not, and we all pay for these schools. Right? And whether you're a school. Right. That's right. They, that's are, exactly. they are taxpayer dollars. They're, they don't, they're right. not owned by the parent. They're also not owned by the school. And that's, and I don't want to get in. I know we got to move on, but I do, I am concerned about accountability for taxpayers, right? We absolutely. fought a revolution to make sure there was no taxation without representation. And I'm worried that these private schools, which I'm not, you know, I don't want to change that for private schools, but. There, aren't, there isn't that a representation for me as a taxpayer. But okay. um, I appreciate you, Chairman thank Frank, you. And, and thank yeah. you for entertaining my questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Members, uh, let's do our Representative Allison. Thank you, thank you Chair Buckley. Uh, Ms. Frank, let me ask you just a couple of questions. And I know you're, you're up here uh, taking the shots right now. Oh, that's all good. And I'm hoping that maybe I can ask you some questions that may be better answered by some of the witnesses you have. But there is an op there's a chance that is the case, but I will do my best. Good. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to talk to you about uh, the average that you use, $9,700. And I, and I understand the reasoning perhaps for using an average, but it troubles me uh, because I don't think we can apply an average throughout the state. Uh, for example, uh, whether it's true or not, maybe we'll, we'll hear more later. I've, I've read an article recently that in Houston, uh, the average tuition for private schools is 23000 a little over $23,000. Uh, in Odessa, it's $20,000. Uh, I know in, in uh, San Antonio, where I'm from, it's, it's up in the $20,000. Uh, so it's, it's a little troublesome. How do we f fill that gap? Uh, if there is one, uh, particularly for uh, less fortunate or underprivileged uh, lower income families. Uh, that's a huge difference to, to make up uh, one. Okay, well, I will, I will defer to some of the folks with, I believe uh, uh, there is a representative of the private school association that can give you those stats. I'm hoping they can get it or are working on getting it by uh, city. Great. Um, Okay, because I think that's that's important. Oh, it's 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 very important. Uh, it's very important. You also mentioned that the the uh, voucher or the, or the payment that you're talking about in your bill would come out of the general revenue come out of general revenue rather than the permanent school fund. Correct. Why is that? Um, just that's the way the bill's written. I mean, because <laughs> I, I I don't see it make sense to. This is not supposed to be is not an attack on public schools. It's not. Um, so it's just funded out of GR or the tax credit. Yeah. So it creates Would another. You prefer it? I mean, I, I'm assuming you wouldn't prefer it out of the school uh, foundation fund, would you? No, I wouldn't. I think there's going to be an expenditure <laughs> either way. Okay. But I'm just, I'm just wondering why general revenue. Uh, is there some other? There's constitutional provisions, aren't there, that come into play? Mm, I, I'm not. Well, aware of that. Well, uh, 
I think it's uh, Article 7, Section 1 of the Texas Constitution talks to the requirement of the legislature to provide a free education system. Right. Doesn't make any mention of private schools. Right. Correct? And I think it's Article 1, Section 7 uh, that talks about uh, can't use public funds for any religious sect, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that I know has come into play, and I believe it was the basis for uh, the Attorney General just issued an opinion that that won't affect educational service accounts, educational right. uh, savings accounts. So it seems to me like there, there is a constitutional issue that we need to address one way or the other, and I think there's another bill to, to address uh, that perhaps. But in, in connection with the Attorney General's opinion, I think he stated that it can't come out of the permanent school fund. It has okay. to come out of general revenue, correct? I, I apologize. I did read it, but it's been a while. I will take, certainly okay. take your word for it. E either way, it creates another strain on the budget for the state. It's going to be additional revenue involved, correct? Right. I mean, I mean, when we say a strain, I'm not understating a half a billion dollars. Um, but I don't think it's a very big strain to give parents choices when kids, regardless of the quality of public school, is falling through the cracks and giving a kid an opportunity. I don't, I don't think that's a great strain, but we can disagree on that. Okay. Uh, you also mentioned, if I, if I heard you correctly, that you don't think that homeschoolers would take advantage of this. I don't think many would, and I certainly don't think they would spend a lot of money on it because there's not a lot of money required. The only thing I could see them doing is perhaps using some tutors, perhaps some, uh, uh, I know there is a problem getting good uh, curriculum. If you're a homeschooler, you know, there can be $1,500 or so worth of curriculum. And so I think the opportunity to get that uh, would be a public benefit to all of us to have. Uh, but, I, but again, I think a lot, of, a lot of homeschoolers don't want any government intervention at all. Well, the part of the reason they're doing that. And, but they would, obviously, if you step into that, then you've chosen to do that. This is similar to the discussion we had last year. If, you, if you're going to play UIL, then you're stepping into my rules, and so you've got to follow the rules. Well, the intervention is one way, isn't it? It's just an influx of, of money, because uh, there can't be any state regulation that follows into a private school, can there? The state yes. can't require the private schools to provide any accountability, take any certain standardized tests, well, that, require certain certification for teacher requirements, anything well, the, like that. Can well, they? The, the the bill outlines it is only sort of it, it is only certified schools, and we have some experts that will talk about what is required in that. But they already do norm reference testing, which I think most of us would acknowledge the norm reference test is as good or better than the star test that we're doing. Uh, there's there is a, we are only allowing. The regulated, not the regulated, but the uh, certified, I'm using the wrong uh, word, um, private schools to be in there. And, and, and they have to be approved by the comptroller okay. for other services. Okay, but, but uh, uh, the state can't impose any restrictions. Can't The state can't say, all right, we'll give you this money, but you have to do this, 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 and this. And the state theoretically can come back at any time uh, it's one of the reasons I'm in the legislature. The state at any point can come in and say, I'm going to regulate. On a private school? On anything. I mean, I think at any point, the state can come in and say they're going to try to do something. Whether it's legal, whether or not you have the votes to pass it is another thing that's not contemplated in this bill. Okay. Uh, you talked about, uh, you brought up first in, in connection with lack of parental engagement. You talked about meals, that it, it took away the opportunity for families to sit together for meals. Uh, you know, isn't it isn't an important part of the meal program to provide nutrition and meals for kids that otherwise wouldn't receive it? Absolutely. I, I think we ought to provide. I mean, I <laughs> spent a lot of time working with that risk youth. I, I think it's absolutely. But when we when we take and all of a sudden we're doing 100 percent of the kids, we are literally pulling that parental involvement away from the parent. I'm not saying that we shouldn't take care of kids that come to school hungry, but I'm saying we should actually engage the parents in that process that we shouldn't just assume your role doesn't matter, we got this. Okay. And I think that's what we're doing with a lot of things. And I think it's almost all with great intentions. Uh, you were talking about intentions earlier. I don't really think intentions matter that much. You can have great intentions. If you have bad policy, it hurts people. Okay. Your intentions really, I, I, I get a little bit tired of the discussion. Well, this person has evil intentions or this person's great intentions. If your intentions are great, but they hurt kids, it didn't matter. 
you hurt kids. I agree with you. Right. But that include that includes the meal program that I think is great and was done with great intentions. But when we pull away from every parent, that family meal and that then I think we need to relook at that and how do we engage parents in making sure that kids are fed. And if somebody's coming to school not fed, that's where we need to get CPS involved. Okay. In my opinion. I, I don't disagree with you. Uh, but let me talk to your first priority group uh, is children that are on the lunch program, correct? The meal program. Yes, sir. Well, that's, it's the, we're using just the income qualifications for that. They don't have to be on the program, just the income qualifications for that. Okay, but if they if they uh, take advantage of that and go to a private school, they lose the meals, don't they? That's a great question, and I, if you would, I know they will ask that. Okay. I know I've been told that, but don't want to lie on a microphone. <laughs> you shouldn't lie anyway. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. That's a fair point. <laughs> really? Okay. Uh, I'll stop right now. Thanks very okay. much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman King. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Frank, yeah. my question, I'm trying to think the best way to frame it. So, got a kid that's not uh, in school, preschool age. Um, they haven't fallen through any cracks yet. How do they get their ESA? So, my point is, so, sibling, big brother has already the family's already taken the voucher. They have the younger sibling. The kid's not school age yet, but then they get to pre-K age. Are they automatically qualified for the voucher, or do they have to go to public school and give it a try first, or how, how does that work for a kid that's never been enrolled in a public school? They, they would automatically be qualified. And how would double they... Check. I'm gonna... How would they get it, though? I mean, I understand if you... They have to be eligible for enrollment, and right. they would have to... Uh, they would have to... And I, I, I and will who get do that they written apply to? to? The, com, the comptroller, and then there's also a separate, um, it's a CEAO, the so uh, there's certified, no, yeah. I guess my point is, on, on that four, five-year-old, four or five-year-old that's going to preschool, they have no school record because they haven't been enrolled anywhere, so the parent would, I don't know, send the birth certificate to the comptroller and, oh. and fill out an application so they could go to preschool at the private school? Uh, I, will, I will work on getting those answers. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Representative Tallarico. Just thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one more, because twice the issue of accountability and STAR has been brought up that public schools have to take these tests or held accountable to these tests and private schools don't. Your answer has been you want to get rid of STAR and you like norm reference tests, which I completely agree with, but I just want to clarify because that's not the reality of what we have now, as much as you and I would both want that. So the reality is, if this bill is passed, there will still be two separate standards of public schools having to take these tests, being accountable to these tests, and private schools n not having to take the tests, not being accountable to the tests. Correct? Unless I, I would be happy to work on an amendment saying <laughs> the only way for this to go into effect is if all schools are held to the same standard. So, you'd, so you would be for the bill if all schools were held to that standard. I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I was checking. No, I didn't know. No, no. That's, uh, but, but am I, but, and I, and I'm I realize you're asking a little questions, silly. but yeah, I, I'm I, being a little silly about the amendment. But my point is, uh, that's going to be the reality, even though we may not like the STAR test, maybe even folks on the dais don't like the STAR test. I just want to make sure we're being honest about that. Well, I, I hope, I hope, and I hope I'm being honest, but uh, I think just like charter schools, public charter schools, led us to districts of innovation to try to remove some of the uh, entanglements that we have put on public schools. I do hope this and other things lead us to try to remove some of those. And I hope this can be used as a jumping point to remove some of those entanglements. Well, and that would be great. But if, but if, that's, not, if that's not a part of this bill or not happening right now, when this goes into effect, it will be not a level playing field. Or that is correct. That's how I would care. And, and, nor, and nor, level, nor level funding. There's about 75% of the funding is going with it, okay. which I think does account for a little bit of the uh, more flexible playing field. And again, that more flexible playing field, I'm happy to work with you on getting. I'm gonna draft that amendment. So. Okay, <laughs> very good, very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. Representative Hinojosa. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a basic question. I'm realizing I'm not quite sure exactly who is covered by this bill. So is it because you have a category of um, 
educational therapies that are covered. You mentioned homeschool um, curriculum. So is it the case that you don't have to be going to a private school to qualify for this ESA? You could be... You have to be eligible to be enrolled in school. In you have to just be eligible. Right. So um, if, if a kid is in public school and then wants to... Because this is an entitlement, right? Your bill says the child... Your bill says it's that... subject to appropriated funds, though. So a parent, really quote, shall receive each year 90% of the state average maintenance and operations. So this is an entitlement. Who qualifies for it? It's not just kids who are paying private school tuition. <coughs> Correct? Correct. They, they can be eligible for it. The spending, they can only spend it on eligible services. So they don't get the money. Okay. The money is held... In their in an account for their benefit, but they only they don't they don't ever receive the money. A parent doesn't receive the money. It is in an account, and that money, if it is spent with somebody who is approved by the comptroller for the benefit of the child, money goes out of that account for the benefit of the child. But the parent doesn't actually receive the money. There's nobody going on vacation on this money. There, the money is held. It is only used if an approved service by the comptroller. Uh, is used for the benefit of that child who is uh, enrollment age for an, okay. for an approved service. That is the only time it is used. So my child in public school then qualifies to pay for some kind of therapy for dyslexia, some online computer program, say. And that would, you said your child in that. public school that, yes. was, that was coming out? No, no, no. A child in public school. No, the child no. in public school would not qualify. Okay. For that. So a child in private school enrolled in, who's going to private school for a homeschool child, is that correct? They, well, if they're currently there, they're only getting the 50%. They're only getting the 50%. They're only getting half but th they of qualify. the funds, but they would, yes, they would qualify. And, and I also, okay, I appreciate that clarification. Uh, does your bill have the remainder of what's left in the ESA going to Go, potentially college funds later? The, the money goes back to the state if not used. Okay. It does get to roll over, uh, and the theory behind that is the educa private education at the lower grades is actually less expensive than that state average, so they could build up funds to be able to pay for the, the more expensive uh, high school years, okay. but the money never ends up, never goes to the parent. It goes back to the state if unused. And I just want to uh, clarify so there was a discussion here had between you and I can't remember a member on, on the dais about prioritizing kids from low-income families. But your second priority of is families that a family of four that makes one hundred and eleven thousand dollars, according to the handout you right. gave us. Yes, right. Absolutely. So yes, not so much low-income. I mean, I don't consider that low income. Well, I think I think it depends. If you have two kids that you're trying to pay twenty thousand dollars after tax, I think that's pretty tough to do. I think, uh, you know, if I look at, you know, somebody making one hundred and ten thousand dollars, and that is the high end, right? But, and that's, you know, if you think it should be a little lower, we can certainly look at that. Um, but the theory there was to give them some help. Uh, makes sense. And so, you know, I've had a helpful person. Um, reach out to me and give me an answer I've been looking for for some time about insurance code. So the um, insurance company, the premium tax, 25% goes to the foundation school program. So did you know that? No, I did it's not. under section 227.001. And so perhaps that's why that fund is used because part of that actually does go okay. to the foundation school program. Finally, um, have you looked into how a voucher system of this scale might affect our TRS system? If we are sending now public money to subsidize another, a, 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 a third um, type of school system that does not pay into TRS, right? Nor take what, out of. Well. That's an interesting question that I, I would like to explore later. But not paying into TRS, we already struggle with a 13th paycheck and 
colas in this state um, with all the teachers we have paying into it. But so that the teachers, right, the teachers pay into it now for teachers who came before. So even let's assume the private school teachers are not getting a payout from TRS, the, they will have to support the teachers that came before, right? But we'll have a, a smaller pool, theoretically, because more kids and more money are being diverted to private schools, this third school system. So have you looked at or have seen data on what that does to the stability of a, a pension system for teachers? No, I haven't. Okay. I, although I think when, I, when I've looked in Florida is probably the best state to look at just based on size and the fact that they've been doing it a long time um, in terms of education improvements. Uh, and so I would, I would, I will try to find out some information. I think I've got a little while before I, cl before I close. Okay. I'll try to get you that answer. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any more questions? All right. Um, Representative, just, just, sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Real quick, real quick. Um, to kind of expand on what uh, Representative Hinojosa talked about, when we, when we look at the ability for public school parents um, to access additional services uh, outside of the public school, where they feel like whether that could be some sort of extra tutoring, tutoring or, or, or what have you. I, I know we, we've actually heard a bill this, this session uh, that allowed for uh, or, or called for uh, initially, I think it was taken out of the bill in the committee sub, but for our, a, a district or, or a parent to use some public dollars to gain a tutor, let's say for reading recovery and things like that. You think it's possible in a bill like this to to have uh, opportunities like that, where you, you know, um, you know, as a parent, what I think about is if my child uh, in a public school, all my kids went to public school, all three public school grads, as I'm myself, and is there not a pathway to where um, if a kid needs additional support, uh, you know, they're not achieving at a level that 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 you you could make this work? I mean, I certainly would support that. I think again, I think when you look at the underlying problem. To me, no matter what public schools do, if you have an unengaged parent, you are going to struggle. And so any tool that is used yeah. to engage the parent more and clearly having options, whether it's in a public school setting, private school, whatever setting, so I would certainly be happy to, okay. to look at that. I mean, it would yeah. be uh, a, you know, a, funding, a funding issue as with all of them, but I think I'd certainly be happy to put something in there. Yeah. When, when we look at uh, the accountability system on our public schools right now, uh, if we look at the, the testing, and, and um, I, I would say that, and I know you reviewed, you have what, 28 school districts? 28 school districts, yeah. Yes, sir. Do you think our, when you look at how your school districts do, do, do are you ever, do you think our accountability system tells us a whole lot what you didn't know before you saw the results? No, sir. Is this a trick question? No, sir. no. I, uh, um, what, yeah. No, no I, 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 I actually feel like we, every year we have great ideas that tie the hands of our school systems more and yeah. more every year. Yeah. And yet they yeah. pass, unfortunately, they tend to pass committee, pass the floor, and, and it's another great idea that makes it harder yeah. to teach. So, so maybe the, the, the reason that some parents choose private school is because... Um, they're not bound by some of the regulation and the, the, the uh, I would say the additional things that, that public schools have to do. Uh, I, I certainly think there is some of that and I think teachers as well. I think some teachers choose to teach there because uh, they're able to teach. Yeah. I think that's worthy in this discussion. I don't want to get off the bill, but I feel like that's a real key um, part of what we're talking about here um, is that something that makes everyone better and recognizes once and for all um, that uh, you know there is uh, there are different ways to do school, right. um, but but it's difficult to to think that putting more regulation on one side versus the other, or at least about taking a hard look at that regulation on one side, uh, is is really important. But I think I think the concept of having parents in public schools have some money that they can flexibil flexibly spend, maybe audacious, to quote. Uh, Representative Hinojosa, yeah. but I think that is would do nothing but improve the engagement. You know, I, I had I had a discussion with the principal. She got principal of the year in our area. She had 550 kids in her elementary school, and I said, "How many kids in your public school?" She is maybe the best principal we have. How many kids in your public school can you move past your parents significantly? 
past your parents, meaning if your parents aren't engaged, how many of those can you save? And I say, is it 25? And she said, oh, not that many. You just, if we don't engage parents with our public school system, whatever tool, I'm not saying you have to be for this bill, but if we don't find ways to engage parents, we're never going to be able to fix it just by putting you know, more money in the system. We have, to, we have to find ways to engage parents, whether it's your idea, whether it's this, whether it's, we have to get parents back in the game. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Members, any more questions? All right, uh, Dr. Allen. I'm saying one more, but I might ask two. <laughs> you have that prerogative. Yeah, it, 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 the curriculum part is bothering me. Okay. Well, you said you could use the money to buy a curriculum or write a curriculum. A not, whole well, not buy it. Ha, every, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. A whole new curriculum different from... Everything has to be approved through the comptroller's office in, in, this, in this setup. If it's not an approved, if it's not a, an approved provider, and we can... Uh, I'm still working with the comptroller, and we can we can work on what that needs to look like in terms of you know if if this progresses, we can work on what is approved curriculum or not. Right now, this is the the roadmap that we have. Okay, so now in public schools, we have uh, uh, a curriculum already. All right. A or a got... a curriculum. We have a curriculum. Okay. We have. My schools are using a lot, I mean, they're using a lot of different curriculums and not everybody using the same one. Well, we test on one curriculum. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. When we take, when we take the test, we test on the curriculum that, that we're accountable to. All right. So now everybody's going to have a different curriculum. Every mama, every private school, every, you can have a different curriculum if you want to. Uh, only, only if it is approved, and we can discuss what that approval looks like if we want to put some tighter guardrails on that. Right now, it would be approved, yes. Uh, but as long as it's approved, as long as it's approved, they could use that. Okay. But we can discuss what that looks like and certainly be happy to do that. One more question about the uh, accountability. <clears throat> Every parent who, who has a choice, who makes a choice, and we give them this money i'm gonna, i'm not going to say uh, the amount anymore because it's, it's fluctuating uh we give them this money and you can spend the money the way you want to spend it where is the accountability uh with that money well they don't get the money it is in an account the parent doesn't get the money it is in an account held by the comptroller the money is it can only go to an approved provider when they provide services for the benefit of the child. That is the accountability. The parent provides the accountability, the comptroller provides accountability in terms of what is approved and what is not approved. Okay. So that would be the accountability. And all of the private schools have norm reference tests and they have their own, and we will have the private school person up here to walk through their process of getting accredited. Finally came up with the word accredited. Okay. Um, their so we, their when, we, when we compare private schools and all of these other choices that you, 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 you're you talking about, and we compare a pri uh, public schools, so we're not comparing apples to apples, we're comparing apples and oranges or grapefruit or whatever, right? I, I, I think you're not comparing the same thing, but I think they're comparable. In fact, I think and some would, some would argue that some of the uh, accreditation process at the private school is superior to what we're doing in the public school sometimes. Mm -hmm. The norm reference test being the chief among those, that a norm reference test is what we take to get into we, colleges, but it's... Can we prove we, that? No, ma'am. I, I didn't... I said, that's why I said some would say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, Chairman Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Frank, I, as you can imagine, there's a lot of other members that are watching this hearing. Really? Don't sit on this dais texting me <laughs> questions and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to answer those. Most of them You I don't know have to ask. answer those unless and, they're friendly. And, and I, I wish that we could have uh, had the chance to visit about this um, beforehand, but I okay. legitimately do not know the answer to this question, and I think it's a legitimate question. Um, the the ESAs are those available with the, the ability to apply for them or gain access to them available to all kids regardless of legal status just like our public schools okay if they, are, if they are eligible to enroll in public schools they are eligible for the ESA okay thank you okay. all right and, and uh, j just for clarification the, the office of the comptroller is administers the the, the accounts yes sir and then there's a uh, 
there is another company, it's a certified education assistance organization, I believe is what it's called, that helps administer it as well. That would be selected by the comptroller. Okay, all right, any additional questions for Chairman Frank? All right, well. Um, Thank you all very much, and I think I've said everything accurate. I will clean up anything I've said inaccurate. Yeah. And accurate, we'll be working on and clarify that at the right. end. We'll see you tomorrow. Yes, yeah, see you tomorrow. No, Thank just, you. No, <laughs> Thank how you. could Thank that be? No. All right, no further questions. We'll proceed to testimony. Uh, just a reminder, um, there's a second overflow room at E1014. If you didn't like the first one, you can go to the second one. It's upstairs, a little exercise. Uh, also, we have resource witnesses from the Comptroller's Office and from TEA here as well, members. So uh, if you'd like to hear from them, we can do that. Um, so we'll uh, begin with invited testimony. Chair calls Jennifer Allman. Okay. All right, we show you registered as Jennifer Allman on behalf of the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops. You'll be testifying for the bill, is that correct? That is correct. All right, thank you. My name is Jennifer Allman, and I'm the Executive Director of the Texas Catholic Conference of Bishops, testifying in support of House Bill 4340. I will focus on the bill's provisions on prioritization and accountability and our capacity to serve students. Chairman Frank has captured all of the bishop's criterion for parental choice legislation by including accountability through accreditation, strong religious liberty and private school autonomy protections, and prioritization of applications based on the financial and academic needs of students. HB 4340 provides an access lane for all types of students in Texas, but allocates greater resources towards those with greater needs. The ESA amounts in the bill would cover most of the K through eight schools and Catholic schools with a rollover feature of the ESA, families can save unspent funds for the increased cost of high school. Our average K through eight tuition in Catholic schools in Texas is $6,800. Our average high school tuition is $10,700. If the amount in ESA is not sufficient to cover the full tuition, we have robust financial assistance programs which provide nearly $50 million of tuition assistance per year to, all, to, to around 50% of the students in Catholic school. The average amount of financial assistance we currently provide is $3,400. I wanna stress that the majority of our students will always be private pay students. There was a question earlier about raising tuition in order to meet the amount of the ESA. That simply won't happen because the base tuition is based on what the market can afford. And in Catholic schools, we have a parish subsidy that highly subsidizes the amount of tuition. We have Catholic schools in Texas where the tuition is $3,000 per family because that's what that zip code and economic area can afford, and we subsidize the rest. Our Catholic schools accommodate students with identified needs and provide instruction that builds a strong foundation for academic success. We are not only a viable option for a student's academic needs, but we also foster an environment where all children learn to care for one another and embrace their differences. Our goal is to provide students with the instruction they need to succeed as learners and achieve high standards alongside their friends. Catholic schools are ready to welcome students under this bill and other bills with religious liberty protections. We estimate that 90% of our schools will participate and we have the capacity to add around 20,000 students in the Catholic schools in Texas. Uh, Chairman Frank mentioned 50,000. It was actually the correct number is there's 100,000 open seats in private schools throughout Texas today. So I wanted to point that out. 89% of our Catholic schools in Texas serve students with special needs and about 11 to 12% of an individual school's student body are students with special needs. I wanna talk about our accreditation process. It covers curriculum and stand, curriculum standards and fiscal oversight in a very responsible way. It requires that the curricula used in private schools be equivalent or greater in rigor to that used in public school, but there is flexibility in the choice of curriculum. All schools should be held accountable to ensure a high academic standard. The Texas Private School Accreditation Commission or TEPSAC coordinates with TEA to ensure quality in those private schools by monitoring and approving accreditors for non-public schools. This accountability has been in place since 1986 when the TEA commissioner recognized the accreditation responsibilities of TEPSAC. Participation requires accreditation standards comparable to TEA, but preserves the integrity and autonomy of private schools. The standards include, but are not limited to, compliance with state and federal statutes, effective administration and governance, annual administration of a norm reference test, 
teaching a balanced curriculum that meets or exceeds public school standards, hired, hiring qualified instructional leaders, student achievement, and indicator-based quality of learning. Insinuations that this bill or any other which requires accreditation would allow for poor quality or fly-by-night schools is offensive to the 920 accredited private schools currently in your district, providing quality education in our community for decades. Fundamentally, we believe that parents are smart and they want their children to flourish. Most students will continue to benefit from a public school education because of the many advantages offered by public schools. This is not a zero sum game where private schools win and public schools lose. It is a win-win for communities when all children can flourish in the educational setting best suited for them. It is unrealistic to expect every public school to be everything to every child and it is unrealistic to expect every private school to be everything to every child. This bill recognizes that public schools will, will remain the predominant method of receiving an education in Texas while allowing children who need something else to have a better chance to access it. We thank Chairman Frank for his work on it and we thank the committee for having a robust discussion today and tonight and tomorrow about this bill. All right, All right members, uh, in, any questions? One, one question. Yeah, Dr. Allen. Why do you think you have 100,000 seats open right now? You just, they're vacant. Yes, it's, they the field? average is about 100 seats per, suit, per yeah. school. Um, and there's a variety of reasons. The, the price point of tuition is part of it. The limited dollars for financial assistance. We raise $50 million a year, but there is a limit to what we can raise. Um, and not every school is right for every child. Private school is not right for every child. Some children and parents will not choose it and do not want it. And we have a great public school system where they can take advantage of what the state has to offer. Just wanted to ask. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I have, I have a, hold on just one second. Um, so you talked about a subsidy, mm -hmm. a pair of subsidy. Tell me a little sure. bit more. I, I didn't, I, I kind of, I didn't catch that part. Yeah, sure. So we have a pair of subsidy so that, you know, most of our Catholic schools, not all, but most of our Catholic schools are affiliated with a particular parish or group of parishes who help subsidize the amount that it costs to educate the child. So obviously we cannot fully educate a child for $3,000 a year in our schools where that's the tuition price point. But the diocese and the parish pay the rest of the cost to educate the child by subsidizing the tuition so that the community where the school is located can actually afford to attend the school. A good example is St. Mary's Cathedral School just two blocks here from the Capitol. Obviously the um, amount of property values around the Cathedral School is very high being a downtown school. Um, but the per tuition price point there is on a sliding scale and the average student is paying more like $3,000. The parish pays the remainder of the cost. So our cost to educate a child is actually on par with the cost in a public school of fourteen dollars to 15000 But what we charge a parent is based on ability to pay in the, in the typical reason in, in their region. And there are a lot of parish schools where the, there are lots of kids on full tuition scholarship and they do not pay. And there's also a uniform exchange program where they can, you know, come to the uniform exchange and get new uniforms without having to pay for those as well. What about meals? Uh, many of our private schools, our Catholic schools do provide meals. Um, we can participate in the federal free and reduced uh, meal program through equitable services where those, those services are able to be provided. And where we don't participate, we often just provide the meals to the students in need in our school. Okay. And then one last thing, just because this is really for me, because I've, I've, I've tried to read this, but just <laughs> we talk about vouchers, we talk about ESAs and all, all this other stuff, but just for the for those of us in the room to set the tone today, what, what are, what are, is there, is that a distinction without a difference? No, there is actually a very clear difference. I think voucher is a common word people like to use to refer to any type of school choice, but a voucher pays specifically for private school tuition and that's all. And it's typically, you know, a check to the school signed over from the parent. Whereas an education savings account is a flexible spending account, a lot like your health flexible spending accounts that you have. You can use it to pay private school tuition. You can use it to pay the fee for service transportation provider if transportation is an obstacle to getting to private school. You can use it for uniforms, tutors, fees. My, my children are special needs. My daughter has dyslexia. And if I were participating in the program, which I will not, but if I were, I could use it for her dyslexia therapy that's in addition to tuition. And so that has a lot more flexibility than what we think of as a traditional voucher. Okay, all right, thank, thank you very much. Members, uh, Representative Harrison. Thank you, uh, Chair, thank you, Ms. Salmon. Um, 
One question uh, that I would like to ask you about is the difference, if there is any, in educational outcomes uh, between ISDs and perhaps schools that are members uh, of your organization. Because presumably parents don't, you know, wouldn't have an interest in moving a kid around if it, educational outcomes would be worse for that child. So I'm curious if you're able to speak to the difference in educational outcomes between your member schools and ISDs real large. So we've talked a lot about testing uh, this morning in terms of norm reference and, and the criterion reference testing. And so um, we use in our, in our Catholic schools, we use norm reference testing. And in the recent NAEP scores, if you were to score Catholic schools as, as if it were a state in comparison to all of the states in the entire country, our scores were higher than any state's public system in the entire country. Now that's a broad average across all schools and the same as in a public system, you cannot judge an individual child by the accountability score of the school or the district because a child can thrive in a tough school and a child can fail in a great school. Um, the same is true in our Catholic schools. Um, but overall, our, our test scores and our um, achievement is incredibly high. Uh, in part because of the holistic nature of our services. Um, and I'll, I'll point out, you know, a couple of the comments earlier in the discussion dealt with, you know, you're dealing with higher income families and high tuition amounts. That is not the case in the majority of the K through eight Catholic schools. Um, we have many, many schools where the majority of the children come from families making $40,000 a year um, with a tremendous amount of strain and struggle. Um, but the parents, as Chairman Frank talked about, are deeply engaged in ensuring that their kids are succeeding. And so it's it's a combination of the parental engagement issue and the school setting. But I think parents that choose their school and choose a private setting are going to be the more engaged parents. That is just a fact because they've gone through the trouble to choose the school. And granted, we're dealing with averages and all the pros and, and cons that come when you deal with averages. But did I hear you say that your member of schools have an average per the NAEP data that is higher than any other state or any state in America, yes. all 50 states? Yeah, all 50 states. Thank you. And then I, I appreciate you mentioning uh, the income level of some of your, your families because I do think there's this misconception that every family that attends a private school is rich. In your estimation, are all of the families that attend your schools rich? Absolutely not. Do many of them sacrifice greatly to be able to put their kids in your member schools? Absolutely, and that's why we really appreciate the thought that Chairman Frank put into the prioritization levels in his bill to ensure those who are sacrificing are still included. Why would a family leave a public school to put them in one of your member schools? There's a million reasons they might choose to do that and a million reasons they might choose to stay in a public school. Mm -hmm. Um, it, could, it could have to do with the STAR test and the amount of pressure a criterion reference test provides to the students, which is why we also support removing the STAR from public schools. Um, but it, it's also the curriculum that we teach, the holistic nature. Uh, certainly there are religious reasons people would choose to come to a private school, a Catholic school in particular. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's the closeness. Um, my kids go to school two blocks from my office. Um, I like that. One, one question I think we're probably going to uh, hear a lot that's already been raised is the constitutionality of ESA programs like this. Uh, given we have uh, the Blaine Amendment and, 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 um, and the constitutional provisions in our state constitution, um, how would you assess the constitutionality of ESA programs like we are discussing here today? Um, because of the way the bill is structured, first of all, it's entirely constitutional because the funding comes from general, general revenue. There is the tax credit scholarship. I was also unaware um, that, that a part of the tax credit comes goes to the foundation school fund. We have no problem removing the tax credit from the bill. We would support a bill with or without the tax credit provision. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing is that the Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly that Blaine amendments are unconstitutional. Um, and the Attorney General in Texas has also certified that. And I think when Bishop Olson testifies in a little bit, he'll give some of the history of the Blaine Amendment um, and why it should be unconstitutional given its anti-Catholic origins. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. All right, Representative Hinojosa. Thank you, Chairman. Um, so I'm Catholic, and so I'm a politician being used to being held accountable, but I also think it's important that I hold my church accountable. You said to me when we met before that the diocese would be supporting those bills that give preference to the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And this bill, Second priority is those making a hundred over a hundred thousand dollars with two kids and a family. So I don't understand how this bill gives preference to the most vulnerable amongst us. 
because the first priority is families making $55,000 per year for a family of four, and that makes up 66% of the kids currently enrolled in public school. The bill itself will likely only fund about 60,000 students uh, out of the 3 million students in public school on free and reduced lunch. We believe that the first priority will fill the capacity available in the bill. But so many of our students in public schools You said it yourself, you have the most engaged families, which is probably, to James Frank's point earlier, why you perform better than other states' public schools, because you've already chosen families, because the choice is your choice, too, to choose sure, sure. families that apply. Um, they have chosen you because they have the means to choose you. You have chosen them because they're the right fit. And so, but so many of our kids in public schools don't even fall into that first prioritization. For instance, do you provide transportation currently to your kids in all your Catholic schools? Not every school provides transportation, but the bill does cover a transportation service being provided. Well, the bill says part of the voucher can be used for that, but it is not clear to me that once tuition is paid for, there is any money left over for In transportation. In a Catholic school, there will be because our K-8 through tuition is $6,800 on average. Okay, and so it's, you're saying that you would if, if your schools receive money from this voucher, you will cover the cost of transportation for all the kids who get it? I can't commit to what every single one of our 250 Catholic schools in Texas is going to do, but I can tell you that transportation is a priority, and I can also tell you that a parent who chooses to go through this process of filling out this application is well aware of their transportation needs when they select what school they apply to, and a parent will make the choice to figure out transportation in order to go to the best school for their child if they're willing to go through the application process to a program like this because those low-income families get to our schools with and without transportation provided today. There is this assumption that it's a choice, but for so many families in poverty, it's not a choice. And I, I, I want to, and you and I have had this conversation, it's not just poverty that is a limiting factor, right? Because we know, for instance, I have a whole list of what qualifies kids for at risk under, um, under law in Texas. Kids who, um, kids who are on parole, probation, kids who have failed a grade, kids who are homeless, kids who um, were in a substance abuse treatment facility, not even to mention the kids who are the children of parents with substance abuse who will never even think about this as an opportunity, much less have the means to take advantage. In my mind, those are the most vulnerable. And it is a zero-sum game for them. You said this is not, but it is, because the money that leaves for the children with the families that have the means, whether it's financial, whether it is education, whatever it may be, any kind of support that they need, the means to leave, take the money and leave behind the most vulnerable in our public schools with less spending. That's why it is a zero sum game. And that's why it's so important to me that when we say we're gonna prioritize the most vulnerable in legislation as Catholics, that we actually make sure that's what we're doing. But the most vulnerable are the at risk kids. The most vulnerable don't have a shot at a voucher that I can see here. Tell I me think, what I'm missing. I think many of the most vulnerable you just outlined are gonna fall into the economic poverty level of this bill. A family member who is you know, abusing substances and, and abusing to the point that they wouldn't be involved is gonna fit in that low income under 55,000 um, poverty level in most cases. But I think the, the wider point is we don't expect that a private school is the right fit for every student and we can't say that no student should have this choice because we cannot provide for every student. Public schools have a variety of choices available and there's magnet schools that cannot provide for every single student, but they exist in our public choice system as an option for those who choose it. And so we don't believe that we should withhold support for legislation, it's particularly where a member has authentically tried to balance the priorities in a manner that addresses vulnerability 
in a in a more deep way than than any of the other legislation proposed this session. And I, I just want to. I really appreciated Chairman Frank saying, I'm so tired of hearing about intent because in, you can have good intent and bad policy, and I don't doubt his intent. Um, and I know that he has tried, and I can just see James Frank written all in this bill, and I, and I, um, I consider um, Chairman Frank a friend. Mm -hmm. And so I know he has tried to do his best by this bill, um, but ultimately not just being low income is a limiting factor for so many of our families, and I know we have leaders of faith communities here today who experience um, that day to day in our communities that it's not just poverty that is a limiting factor. And that is not taken into account in the policy making here in this bill. I want to ask you about something that I learned in this, in preparing for this bill, and that's that, and you mentioned TEA has a mem memorandum of understanding mm -hmm. with the private schools. One is for, um, um, one reason is so that they can make sure credits transfer over between public schools right. and private schools. And I came to learn that another reason is also because a private school teacher that finishes off his or her career in a public school gets the benefit of a, pen a TRS pension. Is that your understanding? No, my understanding is that your years of service are applicable in public or private school for your entering and exiting salary rates. And so, you know, I'm not familiar with TRS and the pension system um, and how it operates, but what I understand to be what where the reciprocity lies is in years of service. So if I work for 10 years in a Catholic school, I'm a certified teacher, if I work for 10 years in a Catholic school and I wanna go transfer and work in an ISD, I'm not a first year teacher, I'm in my 11th year as a teacher. And you're in your 11th year for purposes of TRS as well? I am not sure how TRS works to be honest, but the TEA resource witness can probably answer that question better than I could. I appreciate that. Um, you mentioned that you have a subsidy program in your Catholic schools, but it's not the case, is it, that every child who can't afford to pay tuition gets the benefit? Because I just want to say before you answer that question, I am part of the Catholic community, sure. and I hear the scuttlebutt within our Catholic diocese here in Austin, that every child gets the benefit of having the rest of their tuition paid for. Actually, the there's a it's a not every child gets financial assistance which is probably what you're referring to rather than the parish subsidy every child gets the parish subsidy so tuition at st austin's catholic school i don't remember the exact tuition off the top of my head but say it's seven thousand dollars the cost to educate the child is thirteen thousand dollars not a single child at st austin's catholic school is being charged thirteen thousand dollars every child regardless of income is charged seven thousand dollars as the base tuition which is then discounted with the financial assistance. So the $3,400 I referred to as financial assistance is that portion, but the, the difference between the $7,000 and the $13,000 is the parish subsidy. Um, okay, but there are and families every child that- it's the subsidy. But there are families that can't afford anything and they don't, and they, they don't all get not, the benefit of all their tuition paid for. That's correct. That's why I said there's, we raised $50 million um, in tuition assistance and when that money runs out we have to turn people away because that's how that's the nature of financial assistance just like in this program whatever the legislature appropriates or if there's a tax credit portion whatever is raised in the tax credit scholarship portion is the amount available and when it runs out it runs out all right members uh representative tallarico thank you mr chairman okay. uh, Okay. Let me let me just remind you real quick. Yes. We have nine minutes before we're going to have to go to the floor. So got it. And if you'll remind, if I'm still asking, remind me. Yeah. I don't. Okay. Um, so you, we talked a little about the performance of your students in your schools. Um, you acknowledged that there is a selection bias, meaning parents um, who have the time and mm -hmm. capability and knowledge to be able to take advantage of these opportunities are are going to be different than parents that don't. Um, and so the school, you're not comparing apples to apples is what a selection bias is. Certainly, yes. Right. Um, you also, I wanted to dig into what else you're doing at your schools. You also mentioned um, that you don't have the pressure of the star test or the, the bad things that come along with star testing. Is that right too? Yes. Um, uh, what about uh, student staff ratios, especially in the lower grades? Um, 
the, the largest classroom would probably have 25, 22 to 25 children, um, would be the highest ratio we would have in a classroom, but sometimes it's lower. Um, right. So, uh, so no star testing or pressure from star testing, um, and lower student staff ratios. Those are things we could do in public school if Absolutely. we wanted to on this diet. We would support you doing it. Great. Um, so in some ways we are comparing apples to oranges because of these differences in private schools. Y'all, you do not have to take the star test, correct? Correct. Do you have to report any uh, academic information to the state of Texas? No. Do you have any regulations on curriculum uh, in your we have yes, in the in the sense of accreditation. So the way accreditation process from the state, sorry, from well, but but our accreditation is approved by and recognized by the state. And TEA has a member who sits on the accreditation um, body with TEPSAC for that purpose. And the schools, the the various accreditors hold one another accountable. So the the Catholic accreditation organization is. Um, peer reviewed and checked by the Lutherans and the Lutherans are checking the Catholics and believe me the Catholics are not cutting the Lutherans any slack. Sure. Um, <laughs> so let me clarify. We love our Lutheran brothers. Sure. Um, uh, curriculum restrictions that we pass as the legislature right. do not apply to private schools. Except that we have standards that we must meet or exceed sure. the curriculum standard. And so we are tracking the alignment, but we get to choose the curriculum. Um, and can you deny admission for any reason? Yes. We do have to follow the Federal Non-Discrimination Act, um, but the, the admissions process is a conversation between the parent and the school on the right fit. Um, and if, if we cannot provide the resources to educate the child appropriately, they shouldn't come to the school because it does a disservice to the child. Do you think public school scores would skyrocket if they could deny admission to any student they wanted to? I don't know, but I, I think there should be some changes, many changes made to the public system, but that's not what this bill does today. Um, I, I want to, because I think it's, as someone who attends a private religious seminary, I think it's really important that y'all are able to integrate faith into all of your um, instruction and practices and that worship is a part of learning at your school. I think that's what makes Catholic schools great. Um, are you worried that that's going to end when you heard us having discussion earlier that this may be the beginning of future regulations on private schools, including Catholic schools. I'm not concerned about the way this particular bill is drafted because of the strong private autonomy and religious liberty protections that Chairman Frank has put into the bill. I'm also aware that no matter what the legislature does, you can open up regulation on private school anytime someone files and passes a bill to do it with or without this bill passing. And so the passage of this bill does not usher in any new regulation. And, and you know, as a committee, from time to time, I come before you asking uh, for regulation like access to opioid medications. And there's, there's certain health and safety regulations that we are happy to comply with and request to be put in place for the safety of children. Um, so I think, I think that's a regulation in private schools is an ongoing conversation, but regulation of our religious liberty uh, will always be something we would oppose. And I think that's the concern about uh, this bill or any bill we're going to be considering today is what Pandora's box are we opening? What are the consequences down the road? And as you heard in my conversation with Chairman Frank and with our conversation with Chairman Frank, he said the legislature is, this is possibly going to look at yeah. other regulations. And that's the thing about taxpayers is they tend to want um, accountability. They tend to want to know where their tax dollars are going. They want to say and what happens with their tax dollars. And so I just want that to be something, I know this is something y'all have considered, but something for uh, Catholic schools, religious schools to consider is what um, what may be the unintended consequences going forward if you start to accept public money. Absolutely, and and I think we have good track record in the 33 states that already have parental choice programs in place that we've been able to continue to operate and thrive in those states without those kinds of uh, hampering regulations. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, members, any any more questions for this witness? All right, we appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you. Okay, we are about um, three minutes from being able to stop, or for, for having to stop. We must uh, have a hard stop then. So we're gonna go on uh, at this moment, and uh, and um, we're gonna have to stop for this morning. If there's no objection, House Bill 4340 will, uh, will be left pending. Chair hears none. Uh, HB um, 4340 is left pending.
If there's no objection, the committee uh, will stand in recess until final adjournment or recess of the House or during reading and referring of bills if permission is granted. The chair hears no objection. The Committee on Public Edu Education now stands in recess.